What's up, We're boys on. and girls, everybody? Welcome back. We're doing part two tonight. We had a, we had a little scare yesterday, huh? Uh, I mean, I wish it wasn't scary. It would have been nice if it had been over with, but yeah, we thought Hope was in labor for a second time. So yeah, I was just gonna say. So this is the second time Hope. So Rob lives two hours from the hospital where Hope's delivering. So yep. when Hope has a goes into false labor, Rob has a four hour round trip car ride to take. Now, to be fair, each time we have we've called the labor and delivery unit, gotten their you know their medical opinion. Of course, they don't want to be liable for anything, right? So their yeah. their default is you should probably come in, and it's like. We live two hours away. Are you sure? And they're like, well, that's why you should probably come in in case it's the real thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, what else are they going to say? Because if she does go into labor, it, I mean, it could be a fast labor. It could be. So so this is our third. But it is. it will be the first time she will actually be laboring. Why? So, the first two? Yeah. Maddie was an emergency C-section. Um we had to induce him at three weeks early because he had um, a couple of medical issues that they did not want to let wait, right? So they yeah. we were, they induced, and her water broke. And then she, well, she labored for 12 hours. Her water broke. She labored for another 24, and it, it didn't progress any further. And at that point, they they decided to do, a, like, an emergency section. Um, <clears throat> and then they declared that she wasn't eligible for natural birth any longer so yeah. with iggy we we were planning for a c-section had it all scheduled but then her water broke four weeks early and we drove to the hospital and she had about an hour an hour and a half of labor before they did that c-section but now we're trying to go the natural you know the the natural birth route not fully natural like at home but you know, no, no C-section, yeah. basically. So why and, are you uh, trying for that? You just The more C-sections you have, the more dangerous it gets, right? Eventually, we would be limited on number of children based on, you know, the C-section scar tissue and, and things like that. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I've told the story with my cousin where his wife, uh, she had her third C-section, and the doctors told her she could never have another pregnancy because they saw a window. And a window is right. when the scar tissue stretches so far you can actually see inside of her. And they went to uh, a reliquary where they were showing relics of, you know, all different saints, but there was one of uh, Padre Maximilian Pio. Col Ma oh, Maximilian the, Colby. Right. And yeah. they were naming the baby Colby. So when she went and she touched it, she felt a burning sensation in her stomach. Mm -hmm. She went back to the doctor. And the doctor's like, no, everything's fine. You're good. Like the window was gone. Everything was healed like a total healing. Yeah. It was like unbelievable miracle. So um all right so now we're going to get into part two of of uh the danielic mystery tonight uh oh, while rob's out because hope is eventually going to go into labor and rob's probably going to be out for an episode or two uh one of the episodes i scheduled i'm gonna have jason on and another one i'm gonna have nick cavazos on oh okay so, nice and if it's after the 15th uh, Enoch will be home from vacation. Enoch's away on vacation, so Enoch might come on for one of them. It depends how long you're out for. I don't know if you're going to be out for two episodes, three episodes. We'll see. You know, hope needs you. Hope needs you. Right. So we'll see how it goes. But You should uh, try to get uh, Cavazos to play his banjo on air. That would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to get him on. Like, we've, I've only hung out with him on air with, like, four other people. I've never, like, just hung with Nick, you know? So it'll be exciting yeah. to just hung with Nick for a night. But... Uh, and Jason, I've same thing. I've always it's always been me, you, and Jason, or me, you, Mark, and Jason, or me, Mark, and Jason. I've never hung with just Jason, and I'm 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 looking forward to just getting. Just because we're all afraid it's just going to turn into an hour long uh, yelling match where you're saying the exact same thing over over each other, <laughs> like, like oh. arguing the same point. Over right. Each other. <laughs> Don Don has a good point here when it comes up. You should schedule that Mike Lewis when Rob is out. <laughs> I have an idea for Mike Lewis. I want to get Mike Lewis on and compare the ideal Mike Lewis papacy compared to the ideal Anthony papacy. Like, I want to see how far off him and I are and what we think a good pope is. Well, we both know the first thing you're going to do. You're going to get yeah. the tiara back and put that thing on. You're going to slip the red shoes on. <laughs> All of it. I, might, you, to me. I mean, I'm, you're an Italian. It's natural. You just want to get as much gold and shiny stuff on as possible. 
it's like I want I honestly like my the thing I hate the most about post council is that we don't do those pomp and circumstance. You know, like I like we we no longer glorify God through the senses. The the kingdom, like that the whole idea of that is you're showing the kingdom on earth. It's like even these, even like I, my, I really think, like the reason so much of the demonic is coming back up is because we don't do processions anymore, where we're burning incense mm-hmm. in the street, warding off these spirits. We, we don't, don't have, you know, we don't even ring bells anymore. Like yeah. people don't realize those bells are blessed; they have a special yeah. blessing. Like they're they're supposed to literally like sanctify the air and the area around. Um, yeah, you used to hear the Angelus bells every day. Mm-hmm. If you're in a Catholic country, you would hear the Angelus bells. Get reminded every day to pray the Angelus at 12 o'clock. It's like, yeah. I mean, you still hear it occasionally. Like if you're in certain areas, you might hear it, but it's not very often. Like where, where do you think the Muslim call to prayer came from? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it yeah, came from that's... came from Catholics praying the the canonical hours and doing the Angelus and things like that. It's a it's a smart thing to do. It it you should be reminding your culture to call to prayer and things like that. Mm-hmm. It keeps your culture Catholic, you know. It's like, um, so in in preparation for this, um, I I I went back and I read the Book of Kings again. First, I read Judges. I picked it up from Samson, because who were we just talking to about Samson? Oh, Father Maudsley. Father Maudsley. We were, talking about, we were talking to Father Maudsley about Samson. So I'm like, I have to go back and reread the, the story of Samson. So I read I read Judges from Samson, which is, is pretty later on. It's like Judges 10 or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, it, you really do need to know the story in the Old Testament. And there's a great uh, YouTube channel called uh, The Bible Project that does summaries of these stories. So each book, they give you like an eight or nine minute summary mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good yeah, Margo. It's like bowling. I'm better after one or two. <laughs> Don't. That was a joke. That was a bad joke. I did not say that. <laughs> wow. I'm so sorry. Drive. Is that illegal? You can't have two and drive. You can have one and drive. Um, so the uh, yeah, it's called the Bible Project. So if you're not like big on because re- the Old Testament's hard, man. Like you go through it, and it's like some of the names you're just like, what. Like uh, Zerubbabel and like, yeah. the, the names are just like so absurd. It's really hard. I, that's my biggest problem with Dostoevsky. I have a hard time reading Dostoevsky because it's Pyotr and Fyodor. And so See, when I read, I took I, Russian, so that's like normal to me. Well, I changed the names of Dostoevsky. I, I changed Pyotr to Peter. I changed Fyodor to Fred, like just so that it's easier for me to remember. So, who's doing, so, so, so what do you call uh, Roboam them? Ray so, or. Well, so yeah, I did. <laughs> so it's Ray Bomb and Jay Bomb, and I call them yeah. Ray and Jay. I got Ray, Ray and Jay. Jay. <laughs> okay. I was, I was literally just gonna make that joke, but it's a dead serious. <laughs> so what happens is after all right. So in Judges, the Judges are a strange time because the the Israelites are, they're a mess of a people. Yeah, and they're God, a nation, they're, but they're leaders. A nation, but they're so mixed up with the Gentiles that they keep picking up these awful habits. So God will send uh, Rack, Shack, and Benny. God will send in judges to call the nation back. Mm-hmm. So, but He doesn't pick these like great judges. Like even Sam. Oh, no, they're Sam's, all. They're awful. They're all terrible. <laughs> they're awful. It's so crazy. Like these judges, they come in and they do something amazing with God's power, and then they fall apart. And Israel's just going through this roller coaster ride through judges. Mm-hmm. Um, so then you get King David, Well, you really well, get Saul. Saul, Saul, King Saul, then David, then Solomon, right? And that, that you really should go and do the, the Bible project and listen to the summary of the book of Kings, because it gives you like an eight or nine minute summary from Kings one. And then the same thing for Kings two. Um, so after Saul, uh, after Saul, David comes, then after David, Solomon comes, Solomon builds the temple, Solomon's son. Rehoboam comes in after him and he punishes the Israelites. Like he doubles the taxes on them. He's just awful. And he winds up looking like uh, a, a, um, a Gentile king by the end of his reign. It's like they're a mess. And now, well, the, uh, and when you say the Israelites, you specifically mean the 10 tribes of Israel as opposed well, to the Israel and the Judah. Thing. 
so okay so all jews are israelites not all israelites are jews right so after yeah. the 10 tribes so 10 tri so rehoboam makes such a mess of things that the 10 tribes revolt yes they end up the 10 becoming, northern tribes they end up becoming samaria <laughs> and then getting yep. mixed in with the gentiles they're still israelites but the the the, the southern tribe is judah and that's where we get the word Jew from, right? So, mm -hmm. so all Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. It's a, it's a very strange thing. So, like when Paul is talking in Romans, especially in nine, ten, and eleven, he's talking about my fellow Israelites, but he doesn't say that always. A lot of times, he's talking about just the Jews. So he distinguishes between the lost tribes and the actual uh, southern tribe. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing that if you don't know that, you you get lost in it. And right. so, the 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 Israelites get scattered. They become Samaria. They end up in the Gent, uh, you know, scattered amongst the Gentiles. And the Southern tribe has the temple still, but they have fallen into idol worship as well. So God allows uh, Babylon to come in, sack the temple, and and kidnaps all the Jews. And so they, that, they do they they do that to Israel, the kingdom of Israel first, and then I forget how many years later they do it to the kingdom of Judah. Correct. Yep. So now they they actually take all the all the Jews and and keep them in captivity in Babylon. Now Babylon, we talked about it last episode. They're this tyrannical empire, and they're forcing Jews and Gentiles into this empire, and they're forcing the Jews to actually worship idols and 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 mm -hmm. uh, what would you call that? Uh, uh, like when you bring a, uh, a uh, you know, uh, immigrants in and you want them to, and like assimilate, in culture, assimilate, right? So, I'm sorry, guys. I'm a little. <laughs> <laughs> so they they want the Jews to assimilate with Babylonian culture. Daniel and his four friends are direct descendants of David, and they won't do it. They won't eat the foods that are uh, sacrificed to idols. They won't worship any of the idols or anything. So where we're going to pick up in this story is in Daniel two. And in Daniel 2, I want to just give you guys the summary before we get into Ephesians. So yep. in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king and the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldean said to the king, king, live forever. Tell, the, tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. The king answered the Chaldeans, the word from me is sure. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. The king answered, I know that I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is sure that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king. There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. <clears throat> the king that the king oh the thing that the king asks is difficult and none can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh because of this the king was angry and furious and commanded that all the wise men of babylon be destroyed so the decree went forth that the wise men were to be slain and they sought daniel and his companions to slay them then daniel rep replied with prudence and discretion to arioch the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to slay the wise men of babylon he said to arioch the king's captain why is the decree of the king so severe Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and besought the king to appoint him a time, that he might show the king the interpretation. <clears throat> then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hannah, Haniah. I'm not going to get these names right, guys. So, uh, Hannah, His three friends. Let's go with that. His companions. <laughs> told to seek mercy of God of heaven concerning the mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And the mystery revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. So the, the vision was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. And he sings this whole canticle, blessing God. Um, 
So therefore, Daniel went went into Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. <clears throat> then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said to him thus, I have found among the exiles from Judah, um, so that's the southern kingdom, a man, uh, the exiles from Judah, a man who can make known the king's interpretation. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Balthazar, are you able to make known to me the dream I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king, no wise man, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery. So this is where this book says mystery over and over. Mm -hmm. So no wise men, enchanters, or magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery which the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. <clears throat> your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be hereafter. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what it would be. But as for me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all the living has this mystery been revealed to me but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind you saw O king and behold a great image this image was mighty and of and of exceeding brightness stood before you and in its appearance frightening the head of this image was of fine gold its breast and armor of silver its belly and thigh of bronze its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of clay as you looked a stone was cut out by no human hand and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image, that struck the image became a great mountain and filled all the earth. This image that Nebuchadnezzar sees is a prophecy. The head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar. And Babylon. After him will come the chest of silver. This is the Persian Empire. The stomach of bronze and the thighs <clears throat> of bronze are the Greek, the Greek Empire. Yep. Then the legs of iron and the feet of mixed in iron and clay is the Roman Empire. Rome. So <clears throat> when when Jesus comes into the world, all of all of Jerusalem is awaiting the the, the cornerstone that's going to break this image, and they're awaiting this messiah it's like there's so much that goes into why john when john the baptist goes and starts baptizing and preaching that all of judea goes out to get baptized because they're all like okay this fourth kingdom is here and not only that in daniel 7 daniel actually goes and finds out the exact year that this will happen so it's supposed to be this 70 year exile and it turns out because israel was so disobedient that it got prolonged an additional seven times 70 which is 490 years yep. so 490 years after daniel they have the year that they're waiting for the messiah to come it's like <laughs> everything aligned perfectly for christ to come when he came this prophecy gets fulfilled perfectly. Like, Christ is the like a lot of rabbinic Judaism, Judaism today, is them figuring out different ways as to as to how that number could be wrong, or or how you know we could still be within that period and, and everything like that. When a plain reading of it just, it's the year Christ was born. <laughs> 490 years after Daniel. So when Christ comes and John the Baptist starts baptizing, all of Judea is waiting. Because they know this is the year of Jubilee. Yep. Like, this is the year of mercy. We're going to get our Messiah. And they're waiting, and he comes. <clears throat> now, Daniel 7 goes down a similar path, where Daniel starts having these uh, his own dreams, and he starts seeing these beasts. And beasts with crowns of thorns, uh, uh, you know, uh, a crown of thorns. or Lion yeah. with eagle's wings is bad. Yeah, it's like all these imagery that you see in the book of the Apocalypse. Now, it, it also gets into the Son of Man. So Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man strictly because of the book of Daniel. Where else it's said is in Enoch, which is strange. The book of Enoch says a lot about the Son of Man. Now, I've never read Enoch. I've just heard commentaries on it. And, and there's so he's in Enoch about the coming Messiah, and they always refer to him as the Son of Man. So the reason... Jesus gets crucified is because in the trial, he says, you will see the son of man coming in the clouds 
and seated at the right hand of the father. That is him saying like, because Daniel in Daniel's uh, chapter seven, there's these prophecies saying that he will have dominion over all the earth. Like all of these things just come together so perfectly for this prophecy to be fulfilled. Because when Christ is lifted up, the cross is in the clouds of heaven. Like they're seeing him on the clouds of heaven while he's up on the cross. And while he's on the cross, he's repeating the Psalms. When he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaking me? He's actually repeating Psalms. And, and he's doing it on Golgotha, which, it, I mean, that area is, is where creation happened. It's where the Garden of Eden was. It's where Adam was buried. It's where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. It's, you know, it's all these typological things being fulfilled in that one that one single moment. So now, Paul, we're going to shoot over to Ephesians now. So uh, let me just make sure I got here, that. Joseph has a question real quick. Yeah, sure. Joseph says, we're told that dream reading and the like is forbidden because it's opening us to the demonic. Why is it different here in Daniel? I would assume it's because Daniel is a prophet of God. It's not yeah. him himself interpreting the dream. It's the Holy Ghost yeah, so interpreting it through him. Daniel specifically says, I myself have no power. It can only be revealed to you if God has mercy. And God has mercy on Daniel and reveals the whole thing to him. <clears throat> so I, I, I think like uh, in, in current times, like dream, like trying to understand, like I do still think that some, I mean, we do have mystics that had dreams, right? And yeah. they were considered prophecies so i i just think it's a it's a warning the church gives because they don't want you going to mediums I and mean, things like that we we know we know that god through his angels communicated with saint joseph in dreams um but i think you're right i think so much so much current dream reading is either a through mediums which of course is the occult or it's b through like pop psychology yeah. which you know is how it is honestly kind of kind of a cult too in a sense yeah so yeah it's all dangerous stuff so <clears throat> now so when you get into paul's epistle in the original greek that paul wrote this in it's the longest sentence in all of scripture are we starting with the beginning of ephesians ephesians 1 verse 3 i'm going to start with so this is okay, one give me long a second. prayer and it's it's the longest sentence i think in the english language like, I don't, I don't think there's a longer sentence. Yeah, let me show it here. It is, yeah, that's a long one. That's, yeah. So there's <laughs> one period in the English that w isn't there in the original. It goes all the way to verse 14. So it goes from verse 3 to 14. <clears throat> there's a period it's, in the English language, but wow. it's not in the original. And this is, that I got that from the Scott Hahn talk. So if that's wrong. Okay. Yell at him. <laughs> That's the other thing, guys. Um, I have to like make sure like none of this is my own. Like I, I have to give Dr. Han all of the credit on this. I, I, I would imagine that he would be happy that this is getting out. Like he's not. Um, unless Anthony butchers it, and then he's going to be upset. Unless I butcher it, or unless I don't give him credit for it, right? Like, I'm not plagiarizing yeah. anything. I'm giving full credit to him. There's even going to be some phrases that I say that really struck my heart that he said that I'm going to probably use those because they were really powerful when I heard them, that it, it's just, just go along with this because it really is phenomenal. But it's, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to his per to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us, the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, for he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, that's like what Paul is going to be talking about through this entire the uniting of all things in Christ. So you have this. And we see mystery the, again as well. Yeah. And mystery, mystery of as well. It. The mystery of his will. So this is what Paul is really trying to get across to everybody. That the mystery Paul sees is this image that Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream is a photographic negative of the body of Christ. 
that no longer are we united through tyranny and force, being forced to worship idols, but we are united in Christ to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's it's and it's gonna get profound as we go along. Um let's see, I want to go to all right, so we're gonna go to chapter two. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Oh no, it was chapter one that I wanted to keep reading. <clears throat> okay. Um, in him, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live in the praise of his glory. In him, you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and who believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you like he is <clears throat> at this point he wants your he wants you to really hear what he's saying he's like have the eyes of your hearts enlightened listen to what i'm he's going to tell you mm -hmm. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, according to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in the heavenly places. That's an allusion to Daniel again, where the Son of Man will sit at the right hand of the Father. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age that is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. And you have been made and you have made alive and you and you he made alive when you were dead through trespasses and sins in which he once walked in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh following the desires of the body and mind and so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind this is where paul's getting by grace you were saved you did nothing you were living in sin you did nothing to earn this it's like so um where did i leave off <laughs> God uh, who is rich in end mercy. Of three. Uh, all right. So yeah. So but God who is rich in mercy out of the great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead through our sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in so like he's saying now, right? Like he's not saying it's not a future tense he's not saying that. He's saying, even when we were dead in our sin, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised mm -hmm. us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches for His of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay. So what's he talking about here? Gentiles, like God chose the Jews, right? They have the covenants and all the promises from God. The Gentiles are far off from these promises. Like by grace, God has now chosen to bring the Gentiles into the covenant promises that were really for Israel. So, um, for he is our peace, he who has both won, looking down the dividing wall of hostility. What is the dividing wall of hostility? It's the, the place in the temple where the Gentiles could, could not pass. Exactly. So, what Paul's talking about here, 
the dividing wall of hostility, the, the temple is made up in three parts. You have the outer court, where the, the Gentiles who um, throughout history were able to come and worship the God of Israel. So they were allowed in the outer court. So when Jesus comes and flips the temple tables over, the money that's changers where, temples that, over, yes. that's the outer court. Now, this is supposed to be a place where the Gentiles can come and worship the God of Israel. And they've made it a marketplace. And this enrages Jesus because it's not, it, it, they're supposed to be a shining example to the nations. And instead of being a shining example, they're doing money exchanges. They're just treating it like a marketplace. So that's why Jesus flips the money tables over. Then you have the inner court. Now between the outer court and inner court, this is called the dividing wall of hostility. There's a placard that actually said, if any Gentile shall cross, he shall die. If you were a Gentile and you crossed that line, they would kill you immediately. Paul is talking about the dividing wall of hostility being taken down. You have to understand how important the temple was to, to ancient Judaism. It is everything to them. It's their White House, their Taj Mahal. It's, it's their, uh, you know, uh, Declaration of Independence. It's everything to them. It's the it, whole universe. It, it's where they believe the world was created. Like the foundation exactly stone right. of the temple is is the is the, at the heart of the Garden of Eden. So when Jesus says, "Tear down this temple, and in three days I'll rebuild it," this is the most shocking thing in the world. And the, he's, and he's the, saying, "Tear down this, tear, destroy the world," basically, basically to them, just that's, destroy the that's universe. What he said. Yeah, it's like they just rebuilt this temple after seeing it torn down, and they were brought into captivity. They're all thinking. Not only do we have our temple back, we're going to get our Messiah. We're going to be able to start conquering the world because they're waiting on this earthly Messiah. And Jesus says, tear down this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. They're like, what? What are you talking about? Like he just <laughs> doesn't fit their understanding of what this Messiah is going to be. And the apostles are probably sitting there like, what are you doing? What are you talking about? Why are you saying this? They're probably so confused because that's early on in John's gospel. That's like chapter four or something the turning of the money tables <clears throat> and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access in one spirit to the father so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners but you who are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of god built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets christ jesus himself being the cornerstone that cornerstone that shatters the image in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple I mean, temple also potentially the, the foundation. Yeah. In I think they're also saying Jesus is the, the foundation stone of the... Of, the, of, of the, the temple. Of the temple itself. Yep. In whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Temples don't grow. Right? Bodies grow, temples are built. Mm-hmm. Temples don't grow. So Paul's like mixing his metaphors here. It's a weird thing. In whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built into it for a dwelling place for, of God in the spirit. Like, think about what he's saying there. He's saying, saying the temple is growing and you are being built for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Like, he's got his metaphors mixed, but he's really trying to tell us something here. It's like, Jesus is the new temple. Like you have to really grasp what's going on here. If you're a Jew in the ancient world, well, the the church is the new temple with Jesus as its foundation and cornerstone in each of us Jesus as part of the mystical body. body. Is the temple, right? Yeah. So it's it, look at it like this: the Jews in the ancient world have to go to Jerusalem on Passover to sacrifice the lamb, or mm -hmm. their firstborn son will die. I don't care where you are in the ancient world. You have to travel to Jerusalem during Passover. You can't leave that area of the world. You have to be in that area of the world in order to sacrifice the lamb so that your firstborn son doesn't die. What happens is when Jesus, the new temple, dies, that temple, when Jesus in John's gospel says to the woman at the well, he's, she says, the Jews say we have to worship, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Samaritans say we worship on this mountain, but the Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem. He says, there will come a day where you will worship neither in this place or that place, but you will worship in spirit and truth and you will hear the voice of the Son of God. This is like preposterous to hear. 
that Jesus now becomes the temple, that the kingdom now is wherever the king is. And this is a Eucharistic temple, like it's a Eucharistic kingdom. So wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. And now that the temple is no longer there, Jesus is the temple, wherever Jesus goes and we celebrate the Eucharist, now you have a temple wherever we go. So when you hear Protestants say things like, God doesn't dwell in buildings, he doesn't know. It is a spiritual kingdom, but it's it's a Eucharistic kingdom. It's the resurrected Jesus that makes us the temple of God. For the for the first time the other day, so we've been working on Maddie and Iggy doing the sign of the cross as we we pass a church, right, a Catholic church, and you know every time we tell them. And for the first time the other day, I asked Maddie as we passed the church and he did the sign of the cross why he did it, and he made me so proud because he he says. We do it to show respect to Jesus who is in the church, in the tabernacle. Holy cow, Rob. That's really great that he knows that much. Yeah. It yeah. really is great that he knows that much. So <laughs> Joe's, Joe's saying Anthony's on fire, right? Somebody left a comment the other day, and they said that um, Anthony's, <laughs> Anthony's uh, enthusiasm is infectious. He's like a little kid. Uh, like He's like a little kid who just discovered a magic trick, right? And it's like... I pray that I always have this excitement when I'm talking about this stuff because when you learn something new, it's just, it's the most exciting thing in the world to learn something new from scripture, especially. It's like this is this is this is so intricate to why Protestants really don't understand what, what what's going on here. It's like why are we the body of Christ? Why? Protestants don't grasp that this whole idea of the body of Christ comes from this image in Daniel in Daniel 2 from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's Paul, like nobody calls the church the body of Christ except for Paul. It's not like Matthew does. John doesn't. Right? Yeah. You don't hear it in any of, the, any of the synoptic gospels. You don't hear it in Luke. You don't hear it anywhere. <clears throat> the only place you hear it is in Paul and you hear it in Ephesians. This is so important to understand because this is Paul's in the captivity at this point. He's in prison for two years and he's meditating on these things and he's really starting to grasp these Old Testament things and he's like, what? I, I think <laughs> I think you, you really hear it in Paul and not the others because, I mean, the others, you know, Matthew was a a tax collector for the Romans. Uh, Mark, as a disciple of Peter, was probably something like a fisherman. Mm -hmm. Luke was a physician, right? John seems to have a good grasp of, like, Greek philosophy. But Paul, he was a Pharisee. Like, he knew the scriptures. It's, and you really see it in his writings. It's almost like, why was he the apostle to the Gentiles? Like he should have been the apostle to the Jews. He's the one making the arguments to the Jews, basically. It's like, it, do you know how long it took the church to really understand this? Like, you have to realize that the mystical body of Christ is something so second nature to Catholics today. This this theology took hundreds of years to work out for the church to really grasp what was going on because you didn't you didn't really see it until the church started to take form. And it's like, I think in like the fourth century is when you start seeing some of the church fathers really trying to hammer out this idea of the body of Christ, because it's only in the book of Ephesians, as far as I know, it might be in one of the other epistles of Paul, but I'm pretty sure it's only in Ephesians. And it's, it's really, look, we get our entire ecclesiology from Ephesians. Like, this is why this, what we're going through right now is the Catholic gospel. What Paul is saying here is the church itself is the gospel. Right, like he's, he's saying, yeah. like, like the well, the, the of church Christ. existed before the written gospels, right? So you're right. The church is the body of Christ, is the gospel given to this the world is by Christ. The gospel. So, so, so I'm watching the Candace Owens debate the other day, and I'm watching Ali Stickley or whatever her name is, and she's like, "What is the simple gospel message?" And they boil it down to, "Do you believe in Jesus Christ and confess with your lips?" And they and they quote a couple of scripture verses, and do you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? You're missing it. You don't understand how intricate it is to be part. Look, this is why Sadevacantists are wrong, too. You cannot separate yourself from the body of Christ. You have to stay with the people of God. Like, wherever yeah. the Eucharist is celebrated, it is a Eucharistic kingdom, which is why I actually do believe that the Orthodox in some way are Catholic, because they have a, a coherent Eucharistic theology, and in some way, even though they're at, not united the, under the At Pope, the very least, they're, they're true Christians. Yes. Right? Protestants... They're maybe Christian by baptism, but they are definitely separated brother. You know, yes. they are separated. The, the Orthodox, 
I mean, at the very least, they're very close relatives. And, you know, I would, I would say your average, like truly faithful, you know, Russian peasant a hundred years ago was probably almost entirely Catholic in their belief. Would yeah. they have said they believe in like the American conception? Like if you gave them that title, probably not. If you explained it to them, would they have said they believed it? I bet they would have. Yeah. Yeah, I think even the Orthodox would understand that if you explained it as Mary is the Ark of the, the, you know, the New Covenant and all that stuff. But it's like, this is the Catholic gospel, guys. Like, and, and wait until you see how intertwined it is with marriage. Because everybody thinks Ephesians is just about marriage. No, it's so in, intertwined with marriage and the church and the understanding of the body of Christ. What did she say? She, uh, she's... Yeah. Talking about your comment about Sedificantus. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 Lauren, stay. I'm saying you could look, you can stay. Not, plus, you know, plus, there are Sedificantus like, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like Joe, like, like Lauren, who, who they still believe, like, they still believe like you and I are Catholic, right? right? They still, they are still in communion with the body of Christ. Right. Yes, they they yes. may not believe Francis, Francis is, is a valid Pope, but that's not the same right, thing. But I even question that a bit. Okay. So Lauren, that don't, don't. I'm talking if you're going to a set a chapel and you're considering yourself the true church, like you can't do that. You have to still consider yourself Catholic and in communion with us. Like it, it just, it, we all have to be in communion with each other. So not Joseph, not this, not Joseph, Joseph not Joe Diodati, <laughs> different Joe. <laughs> <clears throat> um, okay. So for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Like, is he bragging? As you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. No, he's where, not whereby most people are reading it going, oh, what's he mean? <laughs> he's not bragging. Listen to what no. he says. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been made, has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is how the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. This is the gospel. That Jews and Gentiles are now united in the new temple of Christ. Like, that is the gospel. It's, it's so profound to him because before the jews were so unique they had to stay separated from the gentiles it was look the first heresy is what the judaizers right and yep. they want to make sure all the gentiles get circumcised paul is like you're out of your mind he's ready to go and fight everybody over it he's like you guys don't know what you're talking about i'm telling you what was revealed to including me. peter he was including he... peter he says if an angel from god comes to you and preaches a different gospel let them be anathema you don't get it. You don't need to be circumcised. No, this is the this is it. Like we don't we don't need the temple anymore. We don't need any of it. This is why no Jews died in the sack of the temple in AD 70. None. Because uh, the early Christians, right after look, you have to realize what's happening in Judaism at this point. The the early Christians are a Jewish sect. They're going mm -hmm. to the temple. They're still oh. worshiping in the temple. They're following all the old laws still. They're just, you know, trying to work things out over here. This is a schism that is so profound in between Jews and Christians at this point that the Christians eventually start to realize, wait, we don't need the temple anymore because we're breaking bread on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week now, which you see in Acts 20. They're gathering to break bread on the first day of the week. They're not even celebrating the Sabbath on Saturday anymore. Mm -hmm. Pe people have to really understand, why do we have a weekend? Look, the, the earth revolves, takes 24 hours to spin. It goes around the sun, 365 days. That's a year. Why do we have a seven-day week? Because God created the world in seven days. Why do we have a weekend? Because the early Christians, some worshipped on Saturday and some worshipped on Sunday. So the Sabbath was Saturday and Sunday. So that became a five-day work week and a weekend to give the Sabbath to Christians and, you know, whatever early Christians were still worshiping on Saturday. That's where we get the weekend from. This is, this is, we're so entrenched in Christian culture that people just don't realize it. It's also from the book of Daniel, you know, where we get the phrase, 
we get the phrase, the writing is on the wall from Daniel. Because Nebuchadnezzar, once again, yeah, sees I didn't know a that. hand writing on the writing wall. On the wall. Yep. And he says to Daniel, what is the writing on the wall? And only Daniel can interpret the writing on the wall. So that phrase, the writing on the wall, comes from Daniel. Well, the sun goes around the earth as <laughs> you know what I said. <laughs> oh, I, I am a geocentrist. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what Paul is saying here. He's like that is, the the mystery that Paul is talking about. That is how the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints. Okay. In, in Paul's writing, he starts off, he says, me, um, uh, he says, the least of the apostles first. Now he says the least of all the saints. Then later he writes to Timothy and he says, me, the chief of all sinners. The, the closer Paul is getting to Christ, it's like John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. Paul is the longer he... So like if you see the earlier epistles, Paul's very brash. Like if you, if you read the, the, the book of the... the, the uh, mute your mic when you tap, Rob. That, I'm sorry. Complain about that. <laughs> so when Paul's writing to the Galatians, you can see he's like a little mad and he's talking about the Judaizers and he's he's telling them... There's one line in Galatians where Paul actually... He's talking about the, the priests of Artemis Ephesia, who have I mentioned a bunch of times on here, where they would actually castrate themselves. And Paul's talking about the Judaizers and he makes a quip and he says, they should cut it all the way off. Because they're talking about circumcision. And he's like, yeah, circumcise, cut the whole thing off. Go be a priest of Artemis Ephesia. If you guys think that's what it is, that's that's anathema. That's not the gospel. I'm telling you what the gospel is. Now, Paul wasn't even a, a, an original apostle. And he's the one getting these revelations because he's so steeped in the Old Testament. And when he cites Old Testament passages, he's citing them like a lawyer would cite previous court cases. So that he's looking at it like a judge that's reading that is going to understand and say, oh, I remember that case. I remember that case. He's citing these Old Testament passages so that the Jews that read this are actually going, oh, wait a minute. That's what that prophecy meant. That's what that prophecy meant. Paul doesn't just randomly throw in these prophecies. He knows the old law, the law and the prophets so well, which is why. I went back and started reading the Old Testament again because I want to be soaked in the law and the prophets so much that when I'm reading Paul, I don't because it doesn't always say when he's quoting the Old Testament. Like I want to be able to read something and see it and go, oh, that's an Old Testament quote. Like I want to know it that well so I can actually really see what Paul's talking about when he's when he's writing. That's another thing uh the Protestants will never really be able to get fully because there's there are multiple times that Paul and others quote uh, the Septuagint. And, of course, the Protestants don't have those books. Yeah, and they have to understand. So, like, they'll say, well, we go, we wrote, we got those seven books out because that's not, that wasn't in the canon for the Jews. Well, you have to remember when Jesus, th this was a point that um, uh, Candace Owen's husband made. The, uh, the Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, right? They don't believe in life after death. And that's because... They don't they have only totally, accept the first five books. Right. They don't have like they're missing those books. So, no, it wasn't in the canon, but it was in the Catholic canon because those are those books where it talks about the afterlife, the resurrection, all those things. The Catholic Church is the only one who has the authority to say what is a biblical canon. So you have the modern day Protestants got rid of those seven books. Who knows why? Just arbitrarily because it didn't match their. It's pretty funny when you read uh, St. Francis de Sales, he is harsh on them. Oh, you didn't like oh, yeah. purgatory, so you got rid of this book. How convenient. Like, he gets furious with them, you know? Um, okay. So, let's see. Where did I leave off? Uh, da, 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 da. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was made, which was given to me by by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for all ages in God who created all things that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Okay, listen to what he's saying there. Listen to this. This is a real, like you can't just read over something like that quick. That through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That is, before angels would come and tell Mary something, right? The angels would come and tell Joseph, do this. The church now is revealing the mysteries to the principalities and powers. Think about that. The angels are sitting back and seeing what God did in man and going, holy cow. And it, it, it is the church doing it, not scripture. Exactly. Like this is how can you be Protestant and read this? Like, think about what they're saying here. This is look, if you ever want to knock a Protestant down, break open the book of Ephesians because they can uh, what can they say? That through the church, the mystery of God is being made known to the principalities and powers that they didn't know the whole story. The angels didn't know everything. And now that through the church, they're actually witnessing something that they're saying, wow, look at what God did with these lowly creatures. The, look how many times they failed. Look at you go through Jewish history and you watch time after time. They fail, they fail, they fail, they fail. Now through the church, you see God's dominion start to spread amongst the earth. How do you guys think the early church spread? Paul's going from city to city and preaching, right? How do you know that city's going to remain orthodox? Paul lays his hands on somebody and they literally receive gifts of the Holy Spirit for prophecy, for for interpreting tongues, for all these things. The, if it, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the earth so that before we even had papal infallibility worked out, before we had any of that worked out, it was like you knew if somebody was touched by Paul, they were going to be an orthodox Be so I'm just so Paul is writing this while he's in prison in Rome, right? Yeah, that's what it's a, for. For this reason, I Paul, a prisoner for Christ. Yeah. So that that was in like 60, 61, yeah, 62. I think, was, I think it's fifty six A.D. Uh, fifty six or fifty eight A.D. So he's been in prison two years. I think he goes. I think he goes in fifty six A.D. It's like fifty eight A.D. He's been in prison for two years at this point. So, like you said, I mean, Paul is saying that. So the, I mean, this is before that the the new testament is a lot of it is even written yeah that that the church for these 20 plus years at this point has been making known to the angels the plan of the the plan of salvation and that the, that paul even the says the here mystery of th god's plan that this was according to the eternal purpose which was realized in christ so the eternal purpose of christ was to leave the church for us and to have the church reveal these things to us yeah, so to me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for all ages in God who created all things, that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose which he, was real, which he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have both in whom we have boldness and confidence of access through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So Paul's suffering. He's like, don't worry about me. Like seeing you, seeing the glory spread. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't even care. I'm seeing the church do this thing. And he's meditating on these things and his mind is blown. And he has to know I'm writing this letter that will be studied for generations to come. And they will really perceive my insights into the mystery of Christ. I mean, he couldn't yeah. have possibly have written that and thought the first time they read it, they'd understand it. What well, what do you make of this? So Paul says, though I am the very least of all the saints. Yeah, so in Paul's time, they were, the people that were becoming Christians were considered saints. It took some time for the church to, to like work out canonization and actually hold people up. So <clears throat> if you really understand what a saint is to us now, it's it really develops in what they would call the dark ages it's not really but it starts off with um uh justin the martyr uh justin martyr um and uh somebody else but it's it's like they they actually start to venerate the saints because god starts to grant favors when they ask the intercession of these people who had passed on because they're really starting to grasp that when you die you're not dead. Like your spirit goes to, to goes to God and God wants you to still have a relationship with the saints that came before us so that you actually know that we are a universal family throughout time and space. And it doesn't matter when, like, I don't know anybody past my great grandfather. 
my family ancestry is the saints. Uh, it's not like, like if you read the Old Testament, like they're always so meticulous about son of this one, son of this one, son of this one. And they go through genealogies that are insane. I don't know anybody past my great grandfather. So when I'm reading about St. Basil in Tom, Tom Holland's book, I'm like, this is my inheritance. Like, this is my heritage. This is what, this is my family that came through time and changed the face of the earth. Our family are heroes. Of course we should lift them up. Um, the word means holy. Yeah, saints does mean holy. Yeah, I was just, I was looking it up in, in Greek. I don't know how to read Greeks or how it would be pronounced, but in Greek, a saint was anyone devoted to the gods or devoted to God or someone who was sacred or holy. Um, so I, Paul really just means anyone, really any member of the church, I would imagine at, at that, that point. point. Yeah. Yeah, at that point, definitely. So it's, it, it's like... But, we, but the church over time develops a, a theology where it wants to hold very specific people up as canon and they call it raise them to the altars right so like even at every church in an old altar like the, the reason that the, the, the new table altars are they don't have they don't have any relics in them like those altars that were up against the wall those all had relics in them some of the tables have little spots for altar stones but not yeah. all but not all of them. And it's not the same thing. Like you would raise saints to the altars because we would see something of Christ yep. in that person. Matter of fact, that's what it was called. When someone was, someone was canonized, they were raised to the altar. Raised to the altars. So it's yep. like we, when we talked to Father Maudsley the other day, we were going over this, but I, I watched A Hidden Life last night, which I haven't seen since it first came out. It's a very long movie, but it it's is, one of yeah. the most beautiful movies I've ever seen, man. It's like, this guy, he's in hes in the church at one point. And you just see the beauty of this gothic cathedral from b before the council. And you're just struck by the beauty of it. And he's having a conversation with this guy. And he, he's talking about how he paints images of the suffering Christ. And he's like, how can I paint images of Christ's suffering when I myself haven't suffered that? And you're, and you're seeing a, a part of Christ in this man who's about to lay his life down because he will not take the oath to Hitler. He won't do it. For those of you who don't know, A Hidden Life is a movie about blessed uh, Franz Jagerstetter, who was uh, in Austria. He he actually did take the, ho the oath to Hitler the first time, um, the first time he served in the military, but he was sent home then. Um, and then I want to say it was in 43, he was conscripted again and was asked to take the oath to Hitler and he refused and was ended up uh, beheaded for it. Yeah, and it's like, but you see how much he's struggling, <clears throat> where he's just like, it, it's almost like the first time he takes the oath, it's really because Germany hasn't gone full out on what they're about to do at that point. Like they're, right. you know, it's it's when it's early on, they're just, you know, Germany's been getting the crud beat out of them after the Treaty of Versailles and all that. So, you know, he goes in the first time, but then once he starts seeing they're going into Poland and they're going into France and they're going, and he's like, I, I can't. This, we're not the good guys. Like I can't, I can't, I can't go along with this anymore. But you see a part of Christ in him. You just do. You see when somebody lays down their life as a sacrifice, it is divine love, and you see a part of Christ in that person. And that's really what we're pointing out in the saints. And we're saying, look, this is a person who lived their life so radically holy that you can emulate this person, and you're really emulating Christ. You're not really emulating mm -hmm. a person. You're emulating Christ because you see or Christ an in aspect this person. of Christ. An aspect of Christ's personality. Now, different saints show a different aspect of him, and your personality type might be suited to be more like that person. So you can see it in Father Aurelia. Father Aurelia is very similar to Padre Pio, which is why he has a devotion oh, yeah. to him. You know, yeah. you can see that he's from that cut of that mold, where my mother could never be like Padre Pio. My mother's really like St. Saint Therese, the little flower. Like, there's different aspects of Christ's personality that will actually, you'll be able to say, wait, maybe I can emulate that and that's how i can emulate christ because you can't be all of christ none of us it's can. why we have so many different uh spiritualities within the church you know whether yeah. you're more of a, a you know someone like a, a thomas or dominican who loves the intellectual study or whether you know you're a passionist who loves to to pray and concentrate on the passion there's so many like you said so many different aspects of the faith and of christ that we can find our little uh you know niche in, right 
Yeah. I, I've been trying to really get myself to like when I meditate on the passion, it's like a lot of times I just try to like, I, I think what I was, I used to do is I used to meditate on like images from the movie, the passion, because you want to really, but, but it's like, we really should be going deeper and saying, okay, well, how can I suffer? Like willingly, like, what are the things that I can do to be like Christ? It's not just focusing on Christ's passion. It's, it's how can I emulate that? Like what, what are ways that I can actually emulate that? I, therefore a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of us all who is above all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That's an Old Testament quote. Like, that's, therefore, where, it is said, when he where ascended was that? on high, uh, that's uh, right after 8. So Ephesians 4, 8. See what Old Testament text that is, because you could do that with verbum, right? Ephesians 4, verse 8. Right there. Click yeah. that. Let's see. Let's see if that brings anything up. It's in quotes. That's all, therefore it is said when he ascended. It's on Psalms, night, Psalm sixty-eight. Now, so that's Paul, Psalm sixty-eight according to the Masoretic. The Dewey Reams is sixty-seven or sixty-nine. I don't know which one. Right, but either way, Paul is not just throwing that in. That's really what he's meditating on and he's seen that when he ascended on high he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men in saying he ascended what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth this is where we get he descended to the dead he he who descended is he who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things and his gifts were that some should be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the works of his ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god to mature manhood to the to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ like we're all going like we're supposed to be made in his image we don't know what we will be but we know we will be like him. This is what he's talking about, being like increasing in holiness. Um, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the cunning of men, by their craftiness and deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, for whom the whole body joined, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied when each part is working properly makes bodily growth and up builds itself in love again mixing those metaphors with the temple growing and the body Mm -hmm. being built look we're going to get into the uh, maybe i'll wait until we get to there before i get into that so all right now this i affirm and testify in the lord that you must no longer live as the gentiles do in the futility of their minds they are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of god because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart they have become callous and have given themselves up to the licentiousness to licentiousness greedy to practice every kind of uncleanness you did not so learn christ assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in jesus put off your old nature which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful lusts through deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on a new nature created after the likeness of god and true righteousness and holiness um then he goes through like a bunch of stuff saying you know be angry but don't sin let no evil come out of you so now let's go to chapter five therefore be imitators of god as beloved children and walk in love as christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to god but fornication and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is fitting among saints let there be no filthiness nor silly talk no levity which are whoa, not whoa, fitting. silly talk yeah, Are we allowed to even do this podcast? <laughs> but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure man or one who is covetous, that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He's referencing what he wrote in Romans. Like the sons of disobedience, the wrath of God is clear. Like 
th mm. there's like a list of things that come and eventually you, the wrath is so bad that you are men desiring men and women desiring women and that like that really is a natural consequence to the the people who practice these things um therefore do not associate with them for once you were darkness but now you are the light in the lord walk as children of light for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to learn what is pleasing to the lord take no part in unfruitfulness okay all right let's go down to 15. look carefully then how you walk not as unwise men but as wise making the most of the of time because the days are evil therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the lord is and do not get drunk where is okay <clears throat> here we go be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body. Look, we all love to hear that, right? Every guy gets all excited. It's like, yeah, wives, be subject. Look, it's not like Christ is the head and we're the torso. Because in other letters, Paul says, not everyone can be ears, not everyone can be eyes, right? So, like, Nobody can be eyes or ears if Christ is the head, if that's what that means. That's not what that means. Christ is the head of the church as Adam was the head of Eve. This is why this is why Paul starts getting into this marital theology here. Like the, the union of Christ to the church is so intertwined with marriage. It's 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 like beyond anything you can even grasp. And marriage, of course, being the first covenant. Right. So be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife of Christ, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Like this, the marriage and the church are so intricate. This is just like I've, I've said, it's like, you can't unconsecrate the body of Christ once it's consecrated. You can't unconsecrate husband and wife because they are one flesh at that point. For no man, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, for this man, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. Back to the mystery again. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commit. For this is the commandment with promise, that it may well be with that it may well may be well with you, and not that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Slaves, be obedient. Um, uh, I was just going to say. With the children and parents, if, as we saw the previous section, chapter five, uh, Paul was talking both about husbands and wives, but also about Christ and the church. So this one, this six is as well. So when he's saying children obey your parents, he's talking, he's saying, you know, lady, obey the hierarchy, but also fathers, you know, priests, bishops, popes, do not provoke your children to anger as well. So, yeah. We should see this yeah. this passage in lieu yeah, we, of, I've of never the church as well. That. Like we skip over that. It's like don't provoke people to anger if, just because you have authority over them. Like it, having authority is such a profound thing. Like you do not lord that authority over and think that oh you have to be subject to me. No, 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 no. no, no, no. We talked about this the other day. It's like a, a, a person that has authority that has to enforce his authority doesn't really have authority. He might have authority, but he has no power. No power. Yeah, it's like, so finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. Besides all these, taking the shield of faith with which you can quench all flaming darts 
of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit and the word of God. Pray at all times. Uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Like it, this is so important that this is the Catholic gospel. It's not just believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. It's not just that you're going to go to heaven if you, you know, uh, it's just they, they just limit it so much to what it really is. It's like the, the, the idea that, that it's that simple it just bothers me. Like they're missing the whole thing. Yeah. Like th this, the, the <clears throat> marital theology is so important. The, the command of men to be men and to really take that role seriously. And it's like, I, I was talking to my son after, after mass the other day, it was pretty funny because we went and it was like one of the worst homilies. It was like a really bad homily. <laughs> the father was terrible, but it was such a good reading. It's like, Jesus is telling the apostles, unless I leave, the paraclete can't come and the paraclete right. will come and he will reveal all truth to you. The paraclete is he who will come and who will show you justice and truth. So it's like, when, when Jesus says that, it's like, this is what we were talking about the other day. When Jesus, when God says in the Old Testament, my spirit will cover the earth, like the paraclete comes and it, the, we don't convert people. God converts people. His spirit has to come in somebody's heart and reveal the truth to them. So we should not have non-Christian friends, but does this include family members who are non-Christians because Jesus said he came to bring a sword and divide family. I wouldn't say you shouldn't have non-Christian friends. Um, I would say that you have to make sure you have community with fellow Christians and cat. Like we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Right. But like, we're called to evangelize people. Like I have been since, since this year, especially, especially the last six months, like I've had, I've had some really powerful prayer experiences where God kind of showed me, like, I can't take my conversations with people lightly. Like every mm -hmm. word I say has meaning and, 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 and like, it's it's you can't just use your words so loosely when you're talking especially dealing face to face right we're online we're goofing around making jokes and stuff but like every conversation i have with people now i try to make purposeful i try to bring things up that might you know spark their interest a little it doesn't have to be shoving jesus down their throat but maybe bring up some of the things that we've been talking about on this show look man you see what's going on on this outside world this kind of looks weird over here what's going on just bring these things up to get people's hearts to just like question things a little bit you know, I would say, and I don't, I, this is just off the top of my head right now, but, you know, it says Jesus, Jesus did say he came to bring a sword. Well, what did Jesus bring us? Jesus brought us the church. The church is that sword. I mean, I'm not going to say don't have non-Christian friends or family members or anything like that, but um, you have to present the, the church in truth. Now, like Father Isaac said while, while he talked with us, you have to know when to do so because sometimes doing pr presenting the fullness of truth sometimes actually causes more sin to enter the world than there would have been. But, um, so d you shouldn't be that sword that divides people present the church as it is, present the faith as it is. And that's and that will the sword. be the sword. That, yeah, that will, be, will the sword. be the sword. And, and like... those people will divide themselves from you. I mean, that's one yeah. thing I've noticed since really coming back to the faith and, and living faithfully is those people that that the church is an obstacle to they they're the ones that leave they're the ones that that separate themselves from you um it it's the wheat separating itself from the chaff really kevin you're saying yes 100 percent question things you should go back and listen to this episode <laughs> if you're willing to question things go back and listen to this whole episode <laughs> That's absolutely true. How would how would anybody revert Kevin back to the faith if no Catholics would be his friends? Mm -hmm. I, Kevin, Kevin, you are um, you're not an atheist, dude. You're an agnostic, and you're going through a phase. You're coming back to the church. You're too. You're dude. You hang around Catholics all the time. Like he's on every Catholic chat. He has a show discussing things with Catholics. He wants to come back so bad. He's just waiting for. He needs look. He, it, I think Kevin is at a point where. He can't force himself to believe something he doesn't know to be true in his heart yet. But I think if you open your heart and you actually go back and listen to an episode like this, you'll see how, like, how intricate God was in his promises, like, and how, 
how unbelievably unlikely it is that these prophecies could be fulfilled like this by chance. It just couldn't happen. Like, Paul is not making this up. Paul is really losing his mind. Like, you guys don't even know what God's showing me. I'm trying to share it with you, and I can only put it in these insanely complicated words, and it's going to take hundreds of years for you guys to extrapolate the full meaning of it. And then people are going to grab this book and read this 1,500 years later and completely confuse everything I said. Yeah. I wish like, Paul had left, the, out, left the out the part about reveal. becoming becoming apostles and prophets, because that would have taken care of so many crazy prot nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's like if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit enlightening the church fathers to these things, we would have came up with wacky theology like the Protestants did. So I have yeah. another question. Was this about the book of Daniel? Yes, it was. Yeah. So it was about how the how the book of Daniel, how the book of Ephesians is really a typological fulfillment of the book of Daniel. So the Danielic mystery in Ephesians, because Paul throughout the whole book is referencing this mystery that's in the book of Daniel. And it shows how... You know, Paul, like, it really is the backdrop that Paul's referencing throughout the entire book. But, yeah, it's like if you don't have the spirit guiding the church fathers, it's then the, we would have came up with the same crazy theology that the Protestants did. You see what happens when some random person grabs the Bible. I was going to say, you, you see that happening very early on in the church. I mean, obviously, you, you mentioned the Judaizers, but you had the, um, the Montanist and, like, I think it was the second or third century who thought they were, you know, prophets and direct mouthpieces for the the Holy Ghost, yeah. um, you know, stuff like that. So the one other thing I want to do to, before we go is I want to connect all of this to the apocalypse. So let's go to Apocalypse 17. Um, 17. All right. So. Now, when you read the apocalypse, all right, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is seated upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away with the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and 10 horns. That's that image from Daniel seven. Again, the woman was arrayed in purple. And scarlet and bedecked with gold jewels. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities in her fornication. And on her forehead was written the mystery Babylon the Great, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of the earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is to ascend from the bottomless pit and to go to perdition. The beast that you saw was, this is Babylon, that was originally with Nebuchadnezzar, and is not, because it's gone, and is to ascend from the bottomless pit. So what I was talking about in the first episode with all these demons arising and these things that are coming back because Christianity is no longer doing those that ringing the bells and throwing the Angelus and they're no longer doing processions and, and, and having incense go around. Those spirits have been released from the bottomless pit. Now, if you really want to go into something wild... You could go into Cornelius Alapidae, and he actually says what, like, what all this is, okay? So you talk about Catechism 675. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity. In the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in a place of God, in place of God, and of his Messiah come in the flesh. So now Revelation 8. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Many died from the water because it was made bitter. So this is Cornelius Lapidae's interpretation. The name word Wormwood denotes a bitter and poisonous nature. This vision is a striking image of an unfaithful bishop. 
Christ gives us the living water while these men give us poisonous water. Countless faithful drink from these streams of poisonous water. They embrace false doctrine and perish. So the, the name Wormwood is denotes a bitter nature. The vision is a striking image of priests and bishops who are giving you poisonous doctrine. Tell me that's not what we're dealing with right now. The fourth Pri angel blue prior to the prior to this, right? Because that's in Revelation seven. That's an eight. Revelation eight. Eight. So prior this to what we're talking about here. Right. But, okay. So now the fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light was darkened and a third of the day was kept from shining. Likewise, the night. The thoughts of many, uh, this is Cornelius Elabene, the thoughts of many hearts are being revealed more and more as the gospel is preached throughout the world. Many reject it, others abandon it. There's a growing decadence in the church. Its doctrine and sanctity shine with diminished luster. The day is less brilliant. The night of ignorance becomes much darker. This is symbolized by the darkening of the sun, the stars, and the moon. Um, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet. Now this is Revelation 9. The fifth angel blew his trumpet. I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So what do we just read? That that the beast will rise from the bottomless pit, right? And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke Smoke came of locusts. Satan, perhaps? Yeah. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given authority like the authority of scorpion, scorpions. Scorpions. When Christ finally... So look, this is what happens in the first century. So this is... Like, John's writing this based on what just happened. Like, he's writing it about the current time, and he's writing about the end of time, right? So in the past. Christ, past, current, and future, all at once. Correct. So when Christ finally appeared, the Jewish Sanhedrin turned the people of Jerusalem against him. They are the stars that fell from heaven and poisoned the waters. The high priest then led the assault on the Messiah and encouraged the false prophets. The way that the way to best interpret this is that the high priest is the fallen star who opened the bottomless pit. The vision notes a period of an exceptional gravity in the church. A priest or bishop who teaches heresy can be compared to the star who falls from heaven. But in this case, the star refers to a particular person whose revolt from the church shall lead directly to the reign of Antichrist. Look. We're talking about a very powerful church figure here who promotes heresy and releases the key to the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit releases these demons and the smoke of Satan. And all these events start to happen. Now, you don't think we could possibly and, be and enduring this right now? It's definitely related to, to the catacomb, right? The catacomb is Absolutely. what's holding back the, right. the more the or less the end time. Yeah. The restrainer is, is holding back the end time. Now, what is the it, restrainer? I've heard I've heard people say it's the Pope, right? We heard um, Dr. Ma, Ma, uh, Dr. Mazza say that. What if it's even Doc, like... Dr. Marshall seems to believe that as well, too. It could be the Pope. It could be the Holy Spirit. Maybe God holds back his Holy Spirit. and Or maybe it's infallibility or something. Who knows? Like, we don't know and we won't know until it's fulfilled. And the thing is, we can't go and make assumptions <laughs> about what it is. Kennedy, don't Kennedy ever shave. The <laughs> for the love of us, for the love of everyone, don't ever shave. So, yeah, Lauren's saying this is deep stuff. It absolutely, I'm glad you stuck around, Lauren, because I hope I didn't offend you before. Because, I, look, I think everybody is reasonable to have doubts about the current hierarchy, right? Like, I don't think you're crazy for thinking that at all. I think what we have to do is be very hesitant to encourage people to go that path because you're talking about encouraging people to leave the church and that's that's something that all of us should have humility about and say who the hell am i to give somebody that advice i just know i'm staying with the people of god because when you look to the first century when christ first came sanhedrin was corrupt the san you know the, the the high priest was the one who released the key to the bottomless pit they were still the people of god well Ju judas betrays christ Right, but they were still the people of God, and yes, Jesus yes. still goes and preaches to them. And when Jesus comes back, it will still be us. There's nowhere else for us to go. That's all I'm saying. There's nowhere else to go. You stay in the church. You stay in this body. We still have the Eucharist. We are a Eucharistic communion. Don't worry about what's going on in Rome. Don't even think about it. Like, seriously, you know what's going on. Accept it and just know that God has control of everything. This could have been Taco, thought of so I, many popes before now. That, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would say John here is, is, might not even be talking about 
a specific pope or bishop. Yeah, or, it may not be a pope or anything. It could be a bishop. Oh, and he might not even be a specific one. He it could just be saying that in that the hierarchy in general yeah. e- ends up failing in their duties, even over a, a, lo- a time period. Right. One hundred percent. Stay in the ark. We are the people of God, guys. You can't go anywhere else. You don't leave. Like, don't go anywhere. Stay here. Don't, don't go breaking off to some group that claims they are the true church. That's all I'm saying. Like every group that especially claims especially if they're they the don't remnant, have the sacraments. But any group that claims they're the remnant goes off the rails. Like they just, I mean, you know, to use our phrase, <laughs> off the rails. They always go off the rails. You stay in the church. I go to a diocesan Latin mass. Like, I don't even go to a chapel. I'm not even saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying I don't. Like, I am a diocesan Latin mass guy. I'll still attend the Novus Ordo on occasion. You know, I try to find the best one I can. But it's like, don't. You <laughs> You want to hear a funny Novus Ordo story? Yeah. So so two of them. So this Sunday, we our, our local Novus Ordo is at like 8 a.m. And we got up like 7.15 and I had a bad back, hope being super pregnant like we barely got ourselves and the kids ready to even go and like I, we didn't get a chance to dress the kids up I, I didn't even get a chance to comb maddie's hair but we made it there and it's the one weekend they asked maddie to <laughs> oh I yeah, to walk out the aisle <laughs> with aisle with 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 flowers to present to mary for may crowding <laughs> the kids he's up there he's got and... he's messy hair he's got his sneakers on that light up so he's walking down the aisle with his light up sneakers and i'm like why the, here, this weekend of funny. all weekends? But here's funny. You would have never done that at a traditional mass. Like no. that, it's just it's almost like when you go to the Novus Ordo, you feel a little more comfortable to be like, all right, whatever, I'm wearing. I'm wearing well, here's the thing: Maddie wasn't out of place yeah. with any of the other kids there. No, not but at all. The, the the funny part of this, what I was really mentioning is, um, we get to the part where you say the creed, right? And of of course. There's always that competition between a couple of people at the Novus Ordo for who can say things the loudest. Well, the person who won that competition for the Creed instead, about halfway through, switched to the Confidior. And the whole congregation being just, you know, sheep following along because no one knows anything at most Novus Ordos just followed along in the Confidior and Father had to stop everyone and start all over. Really? Yeah. It was just... My there I am just... Novus- my worst Novus Ordo story <clears throat> was I was at a mass and the priest changed the words of the creed from for us men and our salvation to us men and us women in our salvation. He changed um, he changed a few things. Then he made us go back to the old responses and say, and also with you, during the Our Father, he came down off the altar, off the, out of the sanctuary, and started holding hands with people in the pews. Whoa. Then instead, of, then he goes, listen, he goes to read the gospel, and the gospel is John 1 that week. In the beginning was the word, and the word was what? He goes, I'm not that crazy about this gospel. I'm going to pick a different one and pick the different. He, I walked out. He doesn't, he doesn't like the gospel that was literally said at every mass for over a thousand years, hey, they're not even in communion with each other. No, I was going to say. I was, I was just about to. I was thinking to myself, I'm not in communion with someone like that. This wasn't I'm just a priest. Not. He was an. He was an activist. I. Yeah. I got up and I walked out. It was the worst experience I ever had in a mass. I had to get up and I walked out. And I was going to make. I was going to stay to the end and really confront him afterward. And I said, you know what? Let me just get out of here because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna lose my cool. I'm gonna say something awful to it him. It becomes a near like, occasion of sin for you. It, it's absolutely. It. And he was a visiting priest. He wasn't the normal priest there, and it wasn't worth starting it. So I just got up, took my family, and I left. And I did a spiritual communion at home that week. Yeah. But guys, did you enjoy this? Like, was this a good episode? I don't know. I mean, I I found that like when I learned all that, that pull that was really the backdrop to all that and this is also some of the stuff we've been laying out on the show with marriage and how, you know, how important marriage is. And it, it's so deeply connected to the divine image of us participating in divinity. Um, do you guys take a sixth century BC or a Maccabean era dating for Daniel? I think the Maccabean, the, the reason why it, some people would say 490 that years before Christ, that's when he is. I would say people think it's the Maccabean era because for instance, like the Septuagint does get, uh, you know, we, the Septuagint manuscripts, 
you know, like you said, come from the come from Aramaic. So that the the mo- oldest sources we have for that may be from the era of the Maccabees. But tradition holds that, of course, the original original manuscripts obviously are much older. So, so Sean, I want to. I have to figure out how I can do it because, like, I I tried to uh, give it to Rob. And I had to like guide him through the site. It's really hard to find on the website. And even the, it's behind a paywall. I had to log in as you. Yeah, because I subscribed to it. But I would. But whatever. I think you could do it for free. I think you could just create a create an account and get in. I don't oh, think really? It's behind a paywall, even. Yeah, it's just it's just hard to get to once you navigate. Like once you're on the site. But the Scott Hahn version, he goes into so much more detail about like like how many times mystery is said in Daniel and how many times mystery is said in Ephesians. And he, he breaks down a lot of things that he does this 10 minute preaching session. That is like, like he goes up and he's like, I want you to soak in the word because God wants to use you more than you want to know that. Like he, because God knows how to light somebody's heart up here. <laughs> it's like we need we need people that can actually preach in the catholic church man like we don't have any good preachers and we really do need people that can preach and and teach people the word of god in an interesting way that they are excited to learn it and it's really difficult so it's like how do you you know i mean I'm, you I'm, know what I'm we could do for another something. episode what? because you wouldn't let me listen to scott hans talk i could listen to it now and we could do an episode where i could critique your version of it <laughs> We could do that. You know what else we could do? Um, we could do uh, the hour in John's gospel. So the, there's several times in John's gospel where Jesus mentions the hour, right? So the first time is at the wedding at Cana when, when Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. He says, my hour, what, what, what have you to do with me, woman? My hour has not yet come. He says it to the woman at the well. And he says, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor that mountain. Then he says, he says it like five times, I think. I know the other time is when... Uh, Joe, I said it on Father Maudsley's episode. Uh, Andrew and Philip come to him and they say, the Greek wants to speak to you. And he says, my hour has come. A grain of wheat cannot uh, produce fruit unless it dies. and th- Unless it dies and then it can produce fruit. It's like, what fruit does a grain of wheat produce? Bread, right? Mm-hmm. At the wedding at Cana, he says... Uh, My hour has not yet come, woman. You know, what have you to do with me? So when his hour does come, he's going to produce wine. It's like throughout the entire Gospel of John, you see Jesus setting up the mass. So there'll be wine because he says, you know, uh, my hour has not yet come. But when my hour does come, you'll have wine. Then he says to the woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So there'll be an hour where... We have bread, we have wine, where we worship in spirit and truth. The people hear the, the, the voice of the Son of God. You know, we could go through that and really show people something in the Gospel of John that would hit bread berries. <laughs> so are you saying uh, Pope Pius is the 10th, 25-minute uh, low masses aren't valid because they're not an hour long? <laughs> so still struggling with how the church is the fulfillment of all this stuff when the church is such a mess. Well, the current stage of the church is a mess, right? But if you take the long view of the church, you see you see that they go through periods of messiness, but it always does. Look, the, the reason it fulfills it is because you have the sacrament. So Jesus says to the apostles, he, sa- he says, oh, are you amazed by these things? Greater works will uh, greater works than these you will do when I am gone. That when the paraclete comes, you will do greater works than I did. What are those greater works? The sacraments. It's not just miracles. It's not just healing people. It's the sacraments. He's literally going to change the face of the earth. How could the church not fulfill these things? Like the church absolutely fulfills these things. We're just going through something right now that is so profound and it's so much part of the story that we've been told throughout the entire salvation history about Cain killing Abel, the first betrayal. Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers, the next betrayal. You have... um, uh, the Jews worshiping the, the golden calf on Moses. That's the next betrayal. You have these constant episodes of betrayal. Judas betrays Jesus. You're going to have that play out in our story as well. So yeah, there's an ele- there's an everlasting kingdom. But you know what else is in the story of Daniel? The story of Daniel is to show when Nebuchadnezzar gets too arrogant and makes himself God, what God shows him is, no, 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 you have power because I give it to you. So when mm-hmm. Nebuchadnezzar gets too arrogant, God makes him an animal, essentially, and he loses his mind and goes off into the wilderness. And God says, until you humble yourself before me, you are going to be like an animal. 
And then Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself and God restores him to being back as a king. Then his son doesn't humble himself and he gets assassinated. What God's telling us in that story is anytime earthly leaders make themselves God, he will punish them and he will put them to rest. And that is going to happen in this one as well. You look like you were going to say something. That's why I shut up. I was just, um, when you, when you said that God told Nebuchadnezzar, like, uh, or Daniel told him that you only have power because God gave it to you. That, it just, um, death penalty. Well, Pilate, <laughs> it's just exactly what Christ said to Pilate. Pilate. Right. Exactly. You only have, you, you, have, you only have power because God gave it to you. Exactly. So, and you'll see throughout even Christian story, like Julian the Apostate tries to make himself God and bring these other gods back and he wants to be worshipped and God humbles him. It ha if you see Julian's end, it's wild. Like Julian ends in a mess. But it happens every time. Even when you look at Germany, right? That, you know, Napoleon. Napoleon. Anytime somebody tries to make themselves like God, the, the, the evil doesn't win. It just doesn't win. Anytime somebody exalts themselves to be God, God humbles them. He is, they are the emblem of God on earth. Just like the husband is the emblem of God in the family. Like all of these things, anytime you get a ruler that gets out of line, God does do something about it. You just have to have faith in that. The periods of the messy messiness during the church is always when the great saints are made. Absolutely. And like, we should be trying to be saints. Like we, Look, the, the greatest thing this podcast has done, especially the last like three months, the shows we've been doing the last three months, they've given me like a fire for my faith again. Like I'm excited to learn things again. I, I'm like excited to talk to people about the faith. I really have, like, I feel like I'm like back to the joy of my original salvation right now, man. It's really, really fun to talk about these things. It's really fun to like share things with people that they don't know yet. I'm really, really loving doing this. You ever think that the smoke of Satan isn't an infiltration of the church, but an infiltration of worship? That the smoke is the incense offered up to false idols. I would, I would say I mean, that makes a lot of sense because, so Paul the Sixth said that you know, sometime in the seventies, right, seven mid seventies. Um, we know the we know like infiltration began much earlier. We know you know Belladad said the communists put or you know put all the communists in the church in the thirties. We know there was Masonic influence before that, so so infiltration of the church um, obviously happened sooner. So if, when Paul the Sixth is talking about the smoke of Satan, it would make a lot of sense that he's talking about something much more recent than infiltration by Masons and communists. And the only thing that makes sense is is the liturgical changes. Kevin, if we're actually piquing your interest, that's that's like you have no idea how how much that means to us. Like even if you're not a believer or whatever, if you're not there yet, it's like th these things are exciting to talk about. It's like there's a way to convey the faith where it doesn't have to be this. Like I think sometimes we get so mired up in the church stuff that you forget the, the, the like the grand story. Like you guys really like you really have to remember. Like I've seen look five years ago, my mom had nine kids. Five years ago, none of them were going to church. Not one of us. Six of us are back in mass right now. Do you know the miracles I'm seeing in my own family? Like, you can't imagine. Like, so if you have kids that left the faith, do not give up hope. Like, don't even think about giving up hope. God is still working miracles. Things, are, Kevin, you left the faith. Don't worry. Like, if you really are honest about seeking the truth, like, really go back and listen to part one and part two of this because, like, I, I like it really does make sense all the things we're talking about, man. It's not, it's not crazy. Like the things we're the, seeing in our culture are pretty freaking bananas right now, and it makes perfect sense. That was one thing I loved about the episode with Father Maudsley on Saturday. Is is and I, we mentioned it during the episode? Is I thought we were getting you know an intellectual argument for the TLM, which I I would have loved. I mean, I love stuff like that, but I've heard it a million times, right? You know, I've read books on it, but instead he walked us through the whole history of the world, how tradition is connected to us, and. I mean, I left. I left that episode more hopeful, um, more hopeful than I've been in a long time. So that was that was great. Yeah, me too, dude. He was amazing. Oh, so that's the other thing. We have him coming back on. Um, he sent me a message, and he wants to talk about evolution. Um, uh, as Kevin, this this one you might be really interested in, in this one coming up. Yeah. So he wants to I'm talk about the. Uh, the potentiality of 
Okay, so this is what he wrote. He said... Um, yeah, what did he say? Okay. Uh, after you suggested we could have another uh, live stream, <clears throat> if something came up, I thought about a subject which I'm trying to make a video about, but it would be great help. To... So, like, look, he's doing these videos by himself, right? And it's tricky to do these. Like, how, like I think when he came on with us, like, we were feeding him good enough questions that he was able to elaborate ideas that I haven't heard him elaborate with other people. Like, I really think we had a really good rapport with him where like he would say something and then you popped in with a bunch of questions. I popped in with a bunch of questions. It was a really, really good interview. If you guys haven't seen the father Maudsley interview, you have to go back and see that. Uh, I mean that I believe the teaching of perennial philosophy on metaphysics makes the theory of macro evolution, absolutely impossible. Specifically Aristotle's teaching on actuality and potentiality means that no species can give rise to a higher one. And nor can the environment nor random mutations. I am 100% agree with that. Like, this is what we're always saying, right? Like, we say, okay, you can have adaptation within a species. But to say that a species, like, if if it's survival of the fittest, how is it that if nature, if natural selection is picking the best genes, how can it pick genes that aren't there? Right? So, like, how can, how can, how can it pick, how can an eye come about if there's no basically, eye? Yeah, basically for change to happen something has to have the potential for that change and for that change to happen something actual has to actualize that potential so so if you have if number one if you don't have an eye uh, and you want an eye you have to both have the potential for an eye and something with an, like it, it something has to actualize that change into yeah. into yeah, you an can't, eye. nature can't select a gene that doesn't exist it can't create a new gene out of nothing like something can't come from nothing it doesn't make sense it doesn't work that way like natural selection should work the opposite way where things should be falling away there should be there should be atrophy not entropy it just doesn't make, and atrophy yeah yeah like it, it doesn't work that way so i really would love to get him on for that because i see adaptation so that's microevolution. you see within a species you'll see you know when when they released uh wild hogs in america they eventually developed tusks Something like that. Skin color is is you know micro adaptation. Something like that, but you're not going to see species jumping. It just doesn't make sense. So, um, what, what do you mean the creation of new genes? And where are you getting that info for? Like, I would need a source on that. Like, I just think that there's so many lies because so much depends on evolution. Like it's 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 the atheist and, creation and what what's creating the new gene like we know we can use like crispr to create new genes but both the potential and the actualization are there we're talking about from nothing right i mean yeah yeah talking about like something coming from like we cannot create life from inorganic matter so where does organic matter even come from like how does that happen like how does organic matter come it doesn't just happen like you can't you can't just say well you create the right conditions like go create the right conditions for something it's not going to just magically happen like you need the first sparks of light of life um mutations eh. yeah but mutation you can't the original spark of life even like you can't, like there has to be the first bacteria. Where does that come from? That can't mutate from nothing. So, all right, we'll we'll get into that when Father comes on. We're coming to the end of this episode, guys. If you like these episodes, please share them with people. I think we're doing something unique on our channel. I don't think anybody else. I think everybody else is focused on the drama in the church, and we're really trying to focus on something different. And it is not easy to come up with original episodes. Uh, Thursday night, uh, we're going to do Off the Rails. We're, I'm going to have a bunch of goofy videos, and then we're going to tackle the Candace Owens debate, but from a different angle than anybody else is. We're going to tackle a Protestant reviewing the Catholic debate. <laughs> so we're going to review a review of the debate because the it's going to be reviewception. It's gonna, yes. <laughs> A Protestant, Ruslan, I think his name is, Ruslan. I actually do enjoy his channel. I think he's great. Um, he accused Candace of doing a straw man argument, and then he himself gave a straw man argument. So we're actually going to name the video exactly what he named his video about Candace, but put his name in there. And we're going to hope he catches his attention. And we we it, never we never pedal in clickbait here. Never. Mm -mm. No, no, no. This is going to be major clickbait. We're going <laughs> to hope he sees it. We're going to hope somebody shows it to him, and then 
We're going to hope he wants to have a conversation with us. I was, I was going to say, oh, yeah. I haven't watched the original, and I'm probably Don't watch not the original. going to. Watch the, I'm going to bring the clips that you need to see. Don't worry. I love how you tell you every time you basically tell me, oh, no, don't prepare for the show don't, don't at all. Prepare. I'm going to bring clips. Let's go in there. Yeah, but you're good enough that you could just see it on the spot. And how it's not, you don't need to prepare. We can go read a theology book to talk about. I that. have learned, though, to scan through all the videos you sent and make sure no one dies in them. Nobody dies and nobody's cursing. <laughs> Uh, all right, man. This is a fun <laughs> one. Is animal fights in the Bible still on the table? <laughs> yes, it definitely is. Yeah, we'll do the Elijah story coming up. Uh, I, all right, man, I really, man. I really do hope. <laughs> I really do hope we have a kid by then. <laughs> Wait. Also, guys, I, for anybody that is not yet, we do. We're supposed to do this at the beginning of the episode with the worst grifters on the planet. Rob, you know what you should do? Create a banner. Create a banner that says join our locals. Create a banner that says click, hit like, hit subscribe. Like, make banners for all that stuff so that we don't, because I don't want to interrupt the show to do that. Like, I hate <laughs> okay. when I watch my favorite show and they're like, blah, 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 and they're just peddling their nonsense. Just make a banner. If people like us, they'll, they'll come and join us on there. It's like, uh, super chats are always available, guys. You guys can always super we, chat us if you want to. We do have those us. live, I guess. Yeah, any live shows, you guys can super chat. So if anybody wants to just do a one-time thing, they can do through super chat. Plus, we have the tip jar. Or you can go to locals and be a monthly, you know, uh, monthly I would say if if uh, if it's not related to something you want to make sure we see or put on screen, don't use super chat just to donate to us because they YouTube take like takes like 30%. Percent. Um, so there, there's other ways. Uh, but if you want to make sure something puts up gets put on screen, then feel free, I guess. Not that I mean, we're, I feel like we're pretty good yeah. about putting stuff on uh, screen. Anyways. Locals is boring so far, Margo. Thanks for the plug, <laughs> but we're going to do something very soon. I think we're going to do like a private stream with you guys, and we're going to start seeing who wants to come on. Like I know Margo would love to come on with us again. We could talk chastity because she wanted to get to that last time she was on. So we could do an episode with Margo to, uh, discussing chastity, but that'll just be for uh, the locals group, and then uh, Christian is going to come on. So uh, Christian, I had, I had talked to on the phone earlier today, and he has some ideas for the show. Plus, he has an interesting story, so we're going to probably get Christian on. Um, and anybody else that wants to come on with us, if you're one of our local supporters and you want to come on the show, if you have a good idea for a show or if you want to sit on and off the rails, I think that's how we're going to handle it. Yeah, the, the point of the locals, it isn't so much to, to make extra content because we don't want – any content to really be behind a paywall the, the point yeah. of the locals is more just to to form a community get to know everyone so it would be cool to get to get other people on video and not even so much have necessarily talk about anything specific just get to know to each hang. other as a group just to hang out we'll do, like we could even like do a specific telegram chat just for local supporters or something so we could do like a video chat with everyone like i don't know how locals works yet I haven't really like played around with it much, but I would like to be able to just like hang with our locals community, you know, <clears throat> do something interesting. Yeah. Man, I'm getting tired. All right, let's wrap this up because I'm exhausted. Um, okay. Anything else? I think no, Thursday off the rails. If Rob's here, great. If not, we'll have uh, Jason. If Jason sits in, we can't do off the rails because Jason's not going to be my tech guy and I'm not going to be able to play videos and stuff. That would be hilarious, actually, though. Just play the audio from my phone like we do old school. No, no, just watching you two try to struggle with it. <laughs> I, I, I can't. Do I it. personally would get a large kick out of that. I can't. I can't. Do it. I'll be holding my phone up to the camera like that. <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be terrible. It'll be. It'll be funny because they'll see, but then they won't be able to hear because the mic's way back here. And oh man, it'll be. Worse. It'll be classic. I classic, Anthony. All right, take us out, brother. Okay.